thank you all so much for coming today. I'm really excited to introduce this session. Uh, my name is Nicole Kennard. I'm the new Assistant Director for Community Engaged Research at the Brooke Byers Institute for Sustainable Assistance. Um, and we've organized this panel in partnership with the Center for Sustainable Communities Research and Education, otherwise known as SCORE. Um, and we've been talking a lot about SDGs today. This session is really focused on SDG 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals. Um, and the title of this session is Connecting for Sustainability, Collaborative Paths to Environmental Justice. So what we're really going to delve into today is kind of about why it's so important to have partnerships between researchers and community groups in place to ensure that the things we design as scientists and engineers and developers um, really have equity and justice principles embedded and central to these technological developments and to these climate strategies. We know that we're at a highly STEM-focused institution, um, and because of that, we can often get really bogged down um, in you know, our own world of technical details. We can get stuck in the lab, stuck in a computer. Um, we need to think a bit about why it's so important to kind of get our heads out of that space, you know, and really think about not just how our research or our work impacts the wide world around us, but also the communities where we work and where we live and the communities that surround us and surround this institution. Um, and also how you know we as researchers can really refocus the framing of what we do to start really to start with community goals and community interests and have that to be really central to how we even frame our research questions to begin with. So uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, we have three amazing pairs of uh, Georgia Tech researchers um, and their community partners to talk with us about the projects and initiatives they work on. Um, so these focus on things like energy equity, climate justice, and housing and land justice. So I'll let them introduce themselves in a moment. I'm also going to introduce our moderator now, Eric Greenlee. Um, so Eric is a computer science PhD student here at Georgia Tech, and he's also a, a PhD fellow uh, within the Brook Byers Institute for Sustainable Systems, um, which means that his research is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, Eric does a lot of community-engaged research, and his work centers around um, building community-driven environmental sensing platforms. Right now he's working on a project uh, with indigenous communities in the Great Lakes region, uh, which is focused on the conservation of manumen, um, which is an Ojibwe word for wild rice. Um, so I will now pass the mic to Eric and we can get started. Yeah. Thank you, Nicole, and welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here today to moderate this panel. Um, thank you to all of our panelists for coming here today. And before we jump into it, I was hoping each person could introduce themselves and just say a little bit about you, what your name is, what your organization that you work with is, and uh, you know what you're passionate about. So we'll do quick introductions and then jump into the questions. We'll just start to my left with Jung Ho. Hello. Hello. Uh my name is Zhang Ho Liu. I'm a research engineer uh, from you know, Georgia Tech Aerospace Engineering. I'm kind of doing uh, energy-related research and uh, teamed up with uh, Dr. E and about uh, try to deal with the uh, EEEJ issue, you know, in a qualitative format. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Erica Holloman Hill, affectionately known as Dr. E here. Uh, I'm a true ATLian born and raised right here in Atlanta, um, and it's exciting to come back home and do this work. I am the chief envisioning officer and chief scientific officer of a small family-ran environmental research consulting firm, and I knew my phone was going to ring. <laughs> um, and so uh, I am excited to be here and to talk about my work with Dr. John. Greetings. Greetings, I'm Ofumaji Egunjobi. Uh, I work with the Harambe House. I'm the f community farm coordinator and I'm also the Sear Hub liaison. And it's good to be here. Uh, Russ Clark, uh, faculty in computer science, uh, as well as uh, uh, with the Institute for People and Technology. Uh, fortunate to work now primarily out of the Georgia Tech Savannah campus. Uh, on this thing we call the Coastal Equity and Resilience Hub, SEER Hub. Uh, and uh, you can tell that we're together. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so looking forward to uh, sharing uh, uh, and hearing your questions and stories today. 
Hi everyone, my name is Sayomalui Laura Lee Raymond and I'm faculty in city planning here at Georgia Tech. I study the financialization of housing and linkages to displacement and dispossession. Hi everybody, Ooh, I'm Allison, um, executive director with Housing Justice League, grassroots organization um, in the People's Town com community. I am also born and raised <laughs> here um, from Atlanta. Um, yeah, I'm excited to talk about our, our work. Awesome, thanks for the introductions, everyone. Um, and just a little bit of context about the structure. We're gonna have some questions that we have prepared beforehand for you know about half an hour, and then at the end, we wanna open it up to questions from you all. So be thinking if you have questions, if I miss anything, feel free to follow up. Um, so we'll just start with a question about how did your relationship form? And we'll start at the, the far end. <laughs> um, I think uh, our relationship formed because of the significance and the impact of housing and the whole overarching system of housing and how that operates and work um, here in Atlanta. Um, and we were doing some, some grassroots work. Um, we had a really sparky person on our team, um, a member of Housing Justice League, um, to reach out uh, to Alora. Uh, we're doing a lot of work around tenant advocacy and tenant rights. Um, and we wanted to, to get some, some folks in there who could really help us um, think through data um, and think about what that means um, to our community. Uh, and also just to, to someone who could help us understand the layout and the landscape of how it really works when we want to present these, um, these issue items, particularly policy items to, to our council members. So, and it was a huge um, opportunity for us to work um, with Alora and uh, all the other professors from, from Georgia Tech that lend so many um, needed resources to us. So we kind of got started from the, out of the lens of, of tenant advocacy. And did you reach out to Alora or how did that, like who made the first move? I don't know, did you reach out? Oh. I don't know, but I'm glad the reach was made. Okay. We touched, and I'm glad it happened. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Do <laughs> you have anything to add, Sayamala? Uh, no, that was great. Awesome. And so, yeah, just in general, you know, we're looking for everyone to add, but, you know, if your partner sums things up, no need to keep talking. <laughs> Middle group. Um, so I, uh, I'll, I'll tell this part of the origin story, I guess. Um, um, uh, we started a project, uh, meaning Georgia, the Georgia Tech team started a project in Savannah about five years ago, uh, focused on uh, flood monitoring, water level monitoring, called the Smart Sea Level Sensor Project. Um, and uh, like good old engineers, we were out showing off our technology and assumed that everybody would be thrilled and want us in their communities. And we were very fortunate that a wonderful leader in the environmental justice community uh, named Dr. Mildred McLean, who leads the Harambe House and Citizens for Environmental Justice, took pity on me <laughs> and said, that's very nice, Mr. Clark, but here's how you got to, if you want to work in this community, here's what you got to do. And she um, welcomed us, uh, but but made sure we didn't screw it up and, and, and taught us basically a lot about how to work in the community uh, and with the community. And uh, along the way, um, uh, brought uh, Afun uh, into the fold uh, as, as he'd been working with Harambe House for, for quite some time, but uh, now full-time uh, working with us. Um, and um, that's sort of uh, how we got here. Well, just like Russ was saying, under the leadership of one of, our, of, of, one of my community mothers, uh, Ia, Dr. Mildred McLean, she, um, I was involved with the Harambe House since about 2015. I went through one of their programs and just stayed in contact with her. And she would always tell me, you know, I'm going to get something for you. I'm going to get something for you. When she found something for me, she was like, oh, come on in. And I want you to be a part of this. And I'm so glad that she brought me in as a community liaison for the Sear Hub. So, um, what what I what I do is I help to bridge the gap between the community and the whether it's the 
academic or whether it's government serve, whether it's the government, but uh, I got that from Doc, Dr. McLean gave me that opportunity. So I'm forever grateful to her and the Harambe House in general and what she started with environmental justice. I was sitting here trying to remember how we met, but more like what you're saying, it's most important. Southeast. The Southeast, oh yes. So the Southeast decarbonization workshop here at Tech, I find myself often the only one in the room sometimes in terms of having an intellectual academic hat and that expertise, but also coming with a very real lived experience. You all see that I'm an African-American woman. I'm a mother of four little, little, little ones. And when we talk about the realities of the wealth gap that exists here in Atlanta generationally, I am a part of the same community that I serve. And so at that conference, um, we learned a lot just about the efforts that are happening around decarbonization. And I heard in that meeting a lot of academicians and <clears throat> businesses talking about community, talking about the ways in which they needed to engage, but yet I looked around and there wasn't a lot of community members, nor um, really how do you begin to move and make these connections and SCORE is doing, I think, a really good job um, with tech and that is how we began and just from a conversation of the technology that he had been developing in terms of the technology that was piloted in, I say my mother's home, because my mother and grandmother purchased this home in 1979, and it's the only way that this family of six could afford to live because we're still holding on to our legacy home. And so understanding how do we bring these legacy homes into smart cities, nobody's thinking about that. As cities are becoming smart, what about these legacy homes? And so we were already thinking on a community-driven approach to that and learning about his senses, it just made sense. And so we've been at the hip ever since. Okay, what is my time budget? <laughs> <laughs> 10 seconds, no. <laughs> well, um, maybe I just add just a little bit. My life uh, before I met Erica was boring. <laughs> uh, actually, it's really true. Meaning, uh, I was reading this uh, project. Uh, I was able. I mean, I am able to see the uh, data from this campus. Meaning, every temperature in the room or zone or kilowatt, one na one right? So that's my job, and uh, I was trying to develop some model or data-driven model, whatever, call it, right? To help our facilities, you know, which is infrastructure and sustainability unit. And uh, I found that, oh, there's something maybe I could be helpful. So I was trying to develop this, my small IoT-based sensor, right? Because it's kind of very useful for them, right? So that was that, and the other thing was, I'm leading the uh, uh, DOE-funded uh, research, it's called uh, Georgia Energy Shed. Uh, the scope of this exercise is to try to model these 11 counties in Atlanta, uh, 5 million people, and plus maybe 1 million buildings. And, and on top of that, I'm trying to model the uh, power grid and the transportation together so that I can actually trace activity based all this you know energy consumption one so and uh, that naturally lead to not only energy efficiency uh, which is kind of boring topic <laughs> but also uh, uh, energy uh, equity issue because that was a part of the mandate of the DOE and I attended that conference the uh, Southeast decarbonization conference and this young woman <laughs> stand out as uh, she was attending these sessions, all those things. I had a lot of questions and uh, thought about it. How do I implement it? There you go. We kind of get connected, you know, almost kind of instantly, right? Because she's talking my concern or my language whatsoever, vice versa. So uh, that's the starting point. Ever since, I was probably like a serving, you know, Dr. East, any kind of data need. <laughs> So whenever I get the data, I try to interpret that, and Dr. Yi said, I knew it already, <laughs> but you just proved it scientifically, yeah. things like that. So that's kind of our relationship, how we evolved. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. 
And so we see that you know, there's no standard like template or format for forming these relationships, right? Everyone's just kind of playing a lot of different roles. There's not a lot of, you know, I mean, there are traditional research and you know, traditional jobs going on, but there's a lot of maybe unconventional roles or people wearing a lot of different hats. I was hoping that each of the panelists could talk a little bit about the, the roles that you play, maybe with an emphasis on the roles that our audience might not be as familiar with or the, the jobs that you do in you know, kind of making this partnership work. I'll start with Allison again. Um, the job that we do? Um, yeah, I think um, it's, a, it's very complicated and, and convoluted, um, <laughs> particularly when you're working with tenants and homeowners and trying to get everybody to understand the important and significance of everybody like making housing a human right. Um, I think for me, my, my role as the executive de director is to understand, particularly as you know, this is a grassroots organization, I'm one of the founders, I'm in the community, so there's a, a heavy load <laughs> on, on me particularly to bring that, those two pieces together. Um, but I think for me, what, what resonates and what sticks out to me in my role is to be, I land in a spot of intervention, um, of being a community advocate, being a resident, and also having the reach um, to, to our partners. So um, I, I just, I, you know, I think my, my role is to, to be the intervener in the, in the, in the way we, we organize, in the way we do research in the way we, you know, push policy, um, in the way we, you know, create and sustain our relationships in the community. So, yeah. So it's kind of like the buck stops with you. Like you're, you're the. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't stop with me. It's, it's, um, it's. I'm a part of it. Uh -huh. I, I don't want to be the the engineer, and I don't want to be the caboose uh -huh. in the middle. So that's where. <laughs> you know, like that's, that. that's basically my, my job, my role. Awesome. So I, I see my relationship with Housing Justice League as, um, and, and I like that I've usually been responsive to requests. I haven't said, hey, let's apply for this grant together. And, um, and when I've done that with community groups, I have to be very careful to not place the, my professional priorities and the timing and demands of the grant onto an organization that is struggling to do the amazing work they do that is incredibly vital to our city. Um, so that, I, I think, I've liked the engagement with Housing Justice League because I've just been, whenever you guys reach out, I try and deliver. And I haven't been asking for much or needed, or been in a position where it's like, oh, I gotta write all these papers and NSF wants this. That's harder, I think, to manage. And I'm in that relationship with other groups and it's like I really have to watch myself. Um, I try and make myself useful and things that we've done over the years are, um, <clears throat> we use Serve, Learn, Sustain funds to help pour some funds into the printing costs for the eviction defense manual. Yes. Um, we used a combination of Spellman Social Justice Fellows program money, the HOPE scholarship at Brown, or the HOPE fellowship program at Brown, and again, serve, learn, sustain funds to pay for stamps when we were doing a postcard intervention during the pandemic to help tenants not get evicted. Um, we partnered with other faculty in interactive computing to design a data system that would give us a list of tenants facing eviction every week during the pandemic so that we could reach out to them, identify landlords that were problematic, analyze policies that weren't being implemented that well. Um, I've spoken at city council, the state legislature, and for the U.S. legislature on the issues of eviction rights in Atlanta, specifically in Atlanta. And before I do that, right, like one of my papers about gentrification came out of a panel that I sat on with Housing Justice League. Uh, one of the tenant organizers really challenged my definition of gentrification. And I was like kind of took that message to heart and I said, I'm gonna write the paper that gets it right. That paper traveled, got paper awards, I presented it for Congress twice, but before I did that, I called up my community partners and said, what's the message that you want put out? Um, because I think that that type of research has to be grounded in what 
the community wants. I don't know what I've done for you guys lately, but, <laughs> but those are the different hats I've worn. And sometimes it leads to publications and sometimes it doesn't, you know? Well, Alora's been very gracious, uh, particularly over during the pandemic, you know, we are trying to We created this Tenants Bill of Rights. We had in the Tenants Bill of Rights all of the lived experiences from the tenants, but we were missing all of the data. Um, so the See a amount, theme here, right? Yeah. The, the data. No, exactly. And so the data that Allure provided for us was spot on. It it told the it was the it was the narrator of the for the narratives, um, and it told the story of why so many renters were being evicted. How and how do we get through this? Um, and so we were able to take that data, was, was also a piece of strategy for us. We took that data, presented it to city council. That's why we have a, a pilot program of right to council. You know, that's why we're, uh, that's why HB 404 is about to be passed in the state house. Yeah. So all of that, uh, yeah, that partnership, those resources that we lack, they fill that gap. Um, but particularly with that Tenants' Bill of Rights, it moved, it just didn't move policy, but it moved a lot of people to think about renters and what they are experiencing and the conditions that they live in, the whole dangerous dwelling. That's order. right. All of that Force. was formulated from the Tenants' Bill of Rights, so you've done a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's key, the gap filling, right, in terms of what I heard from an academician perspective, Stepping back, not thinking about my own professional progress in a place that's publish or perish. And in that model of publish or perish, sometimes your opportunities to be successful at that is the driving force. And it shows up when you come in community. If you don't know any academicians that are out there, how you do your research shows up in how you even engage in community. And what I heard was one, a willingness to do something different and then be willing to stay firm in that difference because I'm pretty sure you possibly got a lot of pushback in the beginning. Why are you doing it this way? What do you mean? And I'm just saying in terms of those gap filling opportunities in kind, those are some of the in-kind services that you can write into your opportunities on behalf of your community that you're then able to fill. And then the data piece is so critical. Our lived experiences, I remind everyone, all of us, because we live in community, you go home to a community, you represent a data point. However, we forget ourselves when we're looking at the data of others. And so I just want to remind folks that as you're looking at the data, bring yourself into the data. Bring your humanity into what you're looking at. Because so much of this justice equality is about returning folks back to our human rights, back to our humanity. And so the data piece is, oh, I love how you say it, it becomes the narrative of the story that is already existing in the lived experience of the people. I just want to jump on that real quick and say that often quantitative scholars are kind of portrayed as forcing a narrative on to community or on to people, and that it has been so beneficial career-wise for me to listen to community and then go do my complex modeling. Having drawn those assumptions and those measurements and collected my data based on what I'm actually hearing, those stories have really resonated nationally. And so I think that that kind of critical quantitative studies approach, I found it very beneficial purely from a career's perspective. And I also think it's the right thing to do um, and something that we can lend to community when we, when we engage as very technical quantitative people. Anything to add? All right, well, um, uh, my position as it relates to Harambe House with the, with the Sear Hub, has to do with one, we coordinate meetings with the community, uh, coordinate meetings with the community to help organize the community as, uh, as it relates to the scope and the, um, the scope of the particular, in this case, the, 
the Sear Hub grant that they have and how can the community use it. And also to be an ear for the community to make sure that if, if it's anything that's, that, that doesn't sound like, if, if it's anything that sounds like they're being forced upon, if it's anything that sounds like they're being taken out of the process, if it's anything that's, that's sounding like that's just neglecting the needs of the community, and also to, um, and just to hear from the community. So in one, on one aspect, just to general set up meetings so they can get the information to see what it is that, you know, why we're coming into your community, what this funding is about, and how can you use this funding. And then hearing back from the community, okay, these are what our concerns are, this is what we want to do, and this is how we think is best to use the funding. So to, and, and also to, and, and to, to, to keep an ear in both the community and in these uh, spaces so I can see what's, you know, what, what can, how can the community use what information is being said and to relay back to them, this is what the community say they need. And also just to learn as much as I can, even if it's something that's outside of, outside of the SEER hub, what can we bring back to the community to help them to, you know, to put them up, quote unquote, put them up on game on what's happening, what's happening on, the, on, on this part, on this side, so let you know, yeah, this is something that you may be interested in. This is something that can help us. This is something that may can help us. This is the angle we may have to take to get what it is that we want from this. And in a lot of the community meetings and members of communities, the leaders of those are elders, and those are like my elders, like my personal elders, like I know them. So, you know, so they it's like, okay, you do this, that, and other. And I'm like, yes, yes sir. sir. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. And so, and, 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 and on that end, and then with the, with the young people, we do, a lot of work, we do a lot of work with the young people, just making sure that they can, um, that, that, that they can have access to this type of, you know, to whatever, what, whatever resources that we can get for them. youth summer programs called the Black Youth uh, Development Leadership Institute. Institute. Um, my boys have participated in it. Um, I know that they're gearing up for one this summer. So just if anybody has youth looking for something to do for a week, it's a beautiful opportunity. On St. Simon's, right? It's on St. Simon's. Um, I'm amazed. Uh, so. Uh, for those in the audience, uh, we we don't work, we haven't work, been working together. But I'm amazed in our conversation and the, this discussion how much our experiences and our lessons learned are like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm like I'm cheering you on as you're you're telling your story. And so the only other thing I would think to add is a, a couple of things. One is um, one of the things we bring is 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 students students and working on projects and and um, and thank you for being here by the way uh, some of our students are here um, and um, but with a very intentional and a very uh, respectful approach to bringing students to work on community projects so that doesn't mean showing up with a bunch of students to a community meeting and saying hey go talk to them Right, um, it means actually working uh, with uh, the respectful and 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 support of our community partners to uh, understand from the communities what the problems are, and then we bring those back to the students and say, "All right, let's let's work on some ideas. Let's work on some." And then after we've worked on them for a very long time and vetted them with our community partners, then we think about maybe coming back to the community members and saying, oh, uh, here's some ideas that the students have come up with that we think might be interesting for you to consider. So that's, you know, that's just one, I, one, one way of looking at it that's a very different sort of than the traditional show up with a van load of students and go <laughs> knocking on doors in a neighborhood, right? Um, and uh, the other thing, uh, we, we have found ourselves most recently spending a lot of time and effort working on proposals, looking at uh, some of the, the federal funding in particular around environmental justice that is available uh, today on the table. But, and, and 
looking for ways that we can help to, to uh, do the work to bring that funding to the community. But with what um, uh, you said at top of the, the key, which is we don't come with our research priorities and say, we want to find funding for that so that we can then go engage community members. It's absolutely the other way around. Um, listening, learning what issues are to be addressed, going and finding those, fund, those sources of fundings that probably aren't from the National Science Foundation. They're probably from Department of Energy or EPA or, or DOT or uh, NOAA in our case uh, for some of the work we're doing. Uh, and uh, very different types of proposals, very different types of activities uh, from, you know, how a uh, person that's been doing research funding for 30 years would typically have, you know, approached a grant proposal. So um, uh, that's a, a really important lesson we've learned and a part of, of what we now uh, hope to bring to the table. You all have anything else to, to add here? That was a question. <laughs> <laughs> it was about uh, the different roles that you play, especially ones that might not be as conventional in, you know, a research setting. Uh, well, uh, maybe this is, could be a good example. Um, Dr. Ian and I actually turned in the uh, research proposal for DOE last Tuesday. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and thanks to scores, help, and everything, you know, of course. So uh, the thing started this way, actually. I mean, I, sh I mean, I have this kind of prototype, and she was like, "Hey, I want to take this thing, you know, home because she has a lot of sensors, these IoT devices, or digital to te digital twin technology kind of wired, right?" And uh, yeah, that was a dialogue. I was thinking, of, hey, maybe you know, I can reproduce this simple thing, maybe more and more and And this DOE's benefit, you know, proposal kicked in. And I was like, hey, what if I can expand it thousands of scale, right? I mean, without her, I would never thought about it. No, but because making is easy, but how do I distribute, right? If you knock the door, everybody say, hey, who are you, <laughs> right? <laughs> Okay, and then uh, and the University of Alabama and Mississippi State University uh, uh, kind of you know, want to join. So we were able to make this uh, kind of you know, modest proposal and successful turned in. So I believe that the, uh, those uh, vision was not even possible you know, without this community relationship. And also it led me to make me think a lot, meaning well, as Erica said, uh, yeah, publish or perish or like a research funding, maybe that's why I told you my job was so boring, okay? <laughs> now I have an inspiration. So I can do something, uh, maybe I can chip in something and then I can actually help communities little, maybe improve things and things, you know? And that was sort of like a claim anybody can think of, but now with this relationship, that's actually feasible, right? And uh, the other thing is, um, uh, I really realized I'm so uh, grateful, meaning once I start to working on it, now a lot of people start to just offer their help. Uh, for example, again, I have uh, this machine, this device, small thing. You want to pick it up and show, show the audience? Oh, yeah, I, I mean, can see. I'm so proud of this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so nothing but just TV remote side. I mean, it measures the uh, indoor air quality, uh, temperature, humidity, and the CO2, and the pressure. Uh, there is a reason why I need to add the pressure, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Anyhow, <laughs> anyhow it's just talk to AT&T or Verizon directly. So, and uh, operation cost is zero, okay? Because I don't really need to collect this data like a millisecond level, right? Like a once an hour, that's fine. So even though I have hundreds of them, I'm not gonna pay anything, right? So that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyhow, so uh, I have this uh, student, undergrad student, who helped me to design and manufacture, by the way, using our Georgia Tech's you know, invention studio, Hive and everything. This is great, great environment. 
And this student, like, uh, they were kind of participating, like, a first robot competition, things like that, right? Has another huge, huge network worldwide, right? And he has this connection, and he actually, you know, connect me to their organization uh, called NILA and the uh, Johnson uh, STEM Academy, uh, uh, the activity center. So my goal uh, for the course share was about $375,000 but I was able to raise a $600,000, so which was kind of, I wasn't really expecting that. So, and it made me think that my position is I really need to think about uh, how to serve, okay, these people. Then people start to really open their heart, so I can probably come up with uh, some, you know, innovations with a passion and heart. I think that's kind of really grateful feeling, and uh, yeah, I just want to stay the track. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You have anything else? Yeah, I'll just say really quickly for me, um, as a scientist, I'm a marine scientist by academic training, um, and so having gone through uh, institutionalization to get the PhD <laughs> from Virginia Institute of Marine Science and Marine Science, I have that academic research understanding. I've always wanted to be a scientist, period. Now I have the ability to bring that scientific mind and do translation and a different research. Research in its traditional sense is extractive, period. And when we talk about African Americans from the medical research to <laughs> any other research here in this country, we can talk about the history of that. And so my approach to now research as a black marine scientist, how do I create processes that aren't extractive but still allow for that academic research rigor? And so how do we add two other R's to research? Make it regenerative, if you're talking about community, right? And then make it restorative. And so I say R3, regenerative, restorative research, and then you hear the development, the D. Well. For us, it's development, deployment, or rather demonstration and deployment, meaning community members have been figuring out innovative ways of dealing with vulnerabilities. I know that that innovative ways can turn into product or processes that help community support itself. And so oftentimes researchers come in, community IP is usurped, community processes are diminished, and what you've heard is a very procedural process that takes time. And most of us in the academic setting don't have that. And if you are really trying to do engagement right, you have to first create the time. And if you don't have the time, don't waste your time going to a community. They will eat you up. You'll be very disappointed. We got one researcher here in Atlanta <laughs> having to go back and ask for an extension. It becomes, I'm sorry about that. I should have hit mute. Um, but it's about thinking how do we do research different if we we're really trying to do it with community. And there is a way. So that's kind of been my role in bringing both the science and my lived experience to this work. Yeah, yeah, I really like that, the concept of translation. I think all of you have touched on translation, translating lived experience into data that can be used in another domain to advocate, translating requirements into something that a technical you know, engineer could understand and then bring back to the community. I think this you know, idea of translation is, is really central to a lot of what folks are doing. Um, so now we wanted to open it up to the audience. Um, so if folks have questions, please raise your hand and we'll send someone out. <laughs> We're gonna go <laughs> silence a cell phone real quick. Which one of you is calling Dr. E? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you guys for this. It's truly astounding to hear about these relationships and partnerships. Well, my question is, 
uh, two parts, but same question. Uh, what does trust mean to your relationship? Um, and what does that look like? And how is it formed? Uh, trust is everything. It, yeah. Without trust, there's nothing else going to move or happen. And how, to, and how does that develop over time? Over time and over, uh, you have to show and prove. You know, it's the, I mean, that's... That's like the foundation of a relationship is trust. So it's, it's, it's everything for us. And um, Harambe House, even the, uh, Dr. McLean trusted me. I trusted Harambe House. The community trusts Harambe House. We trusted Georgia Tech. Georgia Tech trusted us, and so on and so on and so on. <laughs> I agree. I think it's definitely everything. And just again, reminding us, us of our own humanity. Think about how you trust the people that are in your own lives. And if you find yourselves working with community, what does it look like to build that? And for me personally, when trust is broken, it's been because this and actions haven't matched. Mm -hmm. And so at the core of trust, it's not this, it's the actions and just kind of making sure that those two are in alignment. I think, um, I think what I see in the housing community in Atlanta is solidarity. I think that we're all working on different pieces of the problem, but we have some loose sense of what our common goal is. And it's through that solidarity that we know we can rely on each other, we can call on each other. Um, for help, and it's less an interpersonal trust, I think, than something a little bit broader than that that brings in a lot more people. And that's the basis of, I think, my relationship with Housing Justice League. There's other communities I work with where it's very much more personal, and it's maybe not so focused on, let's improve housing conditions in Atlanta, let's make things affordable. Um, but I think that characterizes how I've related with very many different people in community here in Atlanta. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys so much for this presentation. Uh, for some context, my name is Diego. I'm representing the Students Organizing for Sustainability as an executive member. Um, and so I wanted to ask you guys, you know, I actually had a really long conversation about this with um, Dr. Hester from Kamoamoa about how at Georgia Tech there's a lot of talent and there's a huge body of people who are waiting to be galvanized, you know, to be given some sort of project or some sort of actionable task where they can use uh, their passions and their prior knowledge to affect some change of their communities. So I'm wondering if any of you guys have some personal you know, opinions or advice or strategies on how Georgia Tech students can better uh, position themselves to help and impact the greater Atlanta community. I think it's twofold. The responsibility of the student to have the courage to go outside of the campus and get to know community on your own in terms of getting to know the place and not just the institution. And then I also think it's the responsibility then of the faculty members. You all as students represent a transient population, a great long list of transient populations that can come and continue to support community, but the institution is the anchor. The community surrounds that anchor institution and faculty members are kind of like the, the roots for that anchor institution out into community because once you all get tenure, are you going anywhere? Nine times out of 10, you're not. And so even though your students change, the faculty then becomes the anchor, if that makes sense. And so for me, it's a two-pronged approach. Responsibility of the student to one, just go outside of tech. Know that there's a life outside of, of this. Don't get in trouble now. <laughs> and then, the responsibility of the faculty. I think one thing I had to learn was humility. Um, I come from a minority community or a marginalized community. And I thought when I got these advanced degrees that my knowledge would be really valuable. And I had to learn that actually the knowledge that my community had 
was valuable to me and what I needed to do was make myself useful. And to earn the right to publish on that knowledge. I have some useful skills, but I really have to subordinate them to the goals of the community that I'm working with and not walk in there and think, oh, you definitely want to learn from me. Everyone quiet and hear me talk. Like that was, it's the reverse. Um, and that was like kind of the learn from my mistakes. You know, <laughs> that was the kind of thing that I really needed to learn um, when I first started doing this kind of work is just my, where I fit in and how I could help. And I think um, when we talked about this at dinner and last night and on calls earlier, is it, it, the thing we all have in common is that we invested a lot of time. Um, and you just, you can't get away from that, right? Um, and it's time um, away from this campus and in the communities and with the people that we're um, hoping to, to work with, to serve. Uh, and um, you just can't can't replace that. Um, COVID made that really hard for all of us in different ways uh, because we lost some of those opportunities to be in person. But in some ways, it's also opened up opportunities uh, more comfortable. We were, we were on two Teams calls this morning, right? You know, uh, as part of, you know, back working, connecting back in the community. Uh, and those were things that weren't possible, for, you know, didn't happen four years ago. So um, a little bit of both, but definitely uh, we, I think all of us have different the stories of, and many stories of the disruption that this work uh, happened, you know, during, during uh, 2020 and 2021, uh, and that we're just now kind of getting back in some ways. and access to some of the most costly data sets, it's us. Our lived experiences, the poor, the um, marginalized communities. And so even in terms of this data being collected, we are in community beginning to understand the value of our lived experience and how it shows up in data sets to even say those data sets become static in partnership with community and a place like tech, what does it mean to be able to create like a living data set that does cost, because we know that universities and others will pay for it, but the fees then go back straight to community, straight back to the communities whose lived experiences are making up that data set. So access to data set that really comes from your lived experience, yes, it, it's frustrating that I don't have the thousand dollars to go access a database and have to find an academic partner when the other time consuming but also rewarding is to go and collect that data ourselves and go door to door and have those conversations and know that once collected then it becomes valuable too and to that point around access how do we make sure that that data then is accessible to community first for the ways that they they want to use it. So interesting things that are currently being talked about here in Atlanta around data, IP, ownership of data, most definitely. OK, uh, I'd like to add something that actually kind of related to the student's question as well. I think you should write a letter to our GT president, OK, uh, to support you know broke buyers, OK, much further. Right. So because even though you have a great intent, without this organization effort, you know, things are not really easy to engage this community-based exercise. On top of that, uh, I think uh, there are lots of bunch of data out there. Uh, one thing, I, I was, this is very particular example, but you will get it. For this energy share project, I'm trying to collect the uh, tax, I mean, property tax record, which by the way, is actually open to everyone. If you know the street address of the particular house, you know this in housing value, whether or not this home was upgraded, it is heated by gas, things like that, right? That's very uh, open, but it's uh, tax commissioners in each county, uh, I mean, uh, they store this data for various format, okay? So that's one thing, uh, and then I have to, you know, like a 
which is like uh, 11 counties or 25 counties, okay, uh, tax assess officer and comes with a big DVD again, <laughs> that's a messy. So uh, my point here is that there is a commercial database, uh, meaning they collected everything and they put some money on it and the effort on it. It's kind of a little bit more uh, uniform. It's easy to query, okay? But that's expensive, very expensive. And I was wondering, those organizations such as, uh, you know, scores or, uh, you know, broke buyers, right? Hey, this is community asset. Georgia Tech represents community, right? And we know how to treat the data. We know how to retrieve the useful information and knowledge. So if the institution kind of support that, then all these people, not only researchers, but community, they can aware what's actually going on right now. And another database I'm uh, thinking about is the, uh, the Federal Highway uh, Administration. They have to generate this air quality data. I mean, it's obviously, you know, you know, just uh, you know, very obvious, right? So those are the database. Also, we're trying to incorporate to you know, a model because it actually tells you the baseline of air quality, right? And uh, things like that. So, but again, uh, I can get it. But if it's useful, maybe tech as an institution need to have uh, some framework. You call it data lake or data pond, <laughs> whatever, right? And then these researchers, students, faculty members make these things much more available, easy to use, how to decipher one. So, so those are my yeah, answer. All right. Wanna, we both got very intrigued when you said you're collecting tax assessors' data. We want to talk to you later about what you've got. Um, so uh, most of the data that I use is about real estate processes, eviction records, and these are priced for private equity landlords who buy national data sets to do credit screening, to pick their next investment. Uh, they're extremely expensive. So that, I think, would be really helpful. Apparently, people all across the institute using these same data sets, and some universities have data consortiums, so we can kind of group buy this data and all get access. Um, and I'll just put a caveat in there. There's been some discussion about how do we feel about pouring hundreds of thousands of dollars into proprietary data sets that are used to extract from tenants, and really what it is is public data. So the kind folks um, in interactive computing who think about civic data and data feminism, things like that, have kind of helped us think through, yes, sometimes I do go to CoreLogic, buy their expensive data sets. It has been great for my research, but also I really appreciate what Dr. E said about funding our own data collection, um, and that actually being another really important resource and another way that we could think about um, how to generate the data for our research in a way that gives back to community. I think, I think we've all been part of or used a data set at some point that we came to depend on that somebody else finally figured out they could monetize and then it wasn't available to us anymore. Yeah. And um, so it's an ongoing, you know, it's a constant battle. And, and like you said, some of it, so much of it by law is supposed to be open rec public record, yet the cost to actually go get that uh, is, is beyond all of our, you know, the, the, the folks doing this work. So. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, so one last question. We're almost out of time, but if you just real quickly, you could share something you're excited about for the future, whether it's a challenge or something you want to celebrate or, you know, just something to kind of send us out of here in a good way. <laughs> no excitement. <laughs> I think I'm just excited that other people that I work with are excited about the way that their lived experience is now being, um, I don't want to say like advertised, but. Valued it's maybe? Being lifted up. It's being lifted up in a way that it hasn't been, particularly in Georgia. Um, I'm excited about the statewide work that we're doing around rent stabilization. I'm excited about the work that we are about to embark on with Atlanta housing, you know, reintroducing public housing. Um, just excited about how community is showing up in these spaces and excited about the continued and the long lasting non-transactional relationships that we have with folks from Georgia Tech. Piggybacking off of that, 
I'm excited about a lot of the single family. So as we talking um, multifamily housing and renters, we know that one of the largest absentee landlords are these owners of these apartment complexes that are private and not under Atlanta Housing Authority. That's for a whole nother conversation that happened during the Olympics. <laughs> and so in terms of what we're excited about is focusing on single family, residential. So when we look and we scale down to social impact that's in these homes, right now, multifamily models are driving the clean energy without much thought of welcome to the South outside of these urban centers, you're back into single family housing. And what does that mean to create a product and a process that doesn't place the burden? For example, here in Fulton County, if you are a Fulton County resident interested in accessing your state's weatherization fund to drive almost 45 minutes north to Cartersville or reach out to Mr. Tim, the only weatherization coordinator, not only for Fulton County, but also for other counties, so what does that translate? That translates to the state of Georgia sending back millions of dollars of untapped used weatherization funds while the city of Atlanta is grappling with some of the highest energy burden in the country. Those gaps are opportunities that excite me because I've always been able to see myself in the gaps and recognize that that is my niche feeling in those gap filling roles. And so I'm excited, it's a lot of gaps to fill. Yes, I'm excited about the motion that's going forward, the motion for uh, sustainability, the motion for equity, the motion towards us, uh, the motion towards us building movements based on humanity, as Dr. E was saying. And and the, um, it's, it's you you were getting a lot of we uh, a lot of things are being exposed and we're getting a lot of uh, things that in the past you didn't you wouldn't have people talking about certain things that they are and it seems to be a shift it seems to be a shift towards um, character based models mm -hmm. models based on you know, based on your character and values as opposed to bottom line. Thank you everyone so much and can we give them a big round of applause.